Hey, you know, it's Prezzo here. I'm here with a sort of a channel update, I think that's what it's called. I made a number of projects this year and I did say I would revisit those and let you know how they're going. Uh, the first one is this, uh, which is a Lixi clock. Now this is a, an edge lit display digital clock using RGB LEDs to edge lit the panel or edge light the panels and it uses an ESP8266 Wi-Fi microcontroller to get its time from the internet. And when I first built this, I took the code that was written by Conan Ishijima, who was the original uh, designer of these particular panels, and I tweaked it a bit to include the columns between the digits. That was something that Conan didn't have in his original design. And through sheer dumb luck and trial and error, I managed to get that working. Now, one of my viewers, Mitch Markin, also built one of these clocks and he had made a number of improvements to the original code that Connor had written. So Mitch sent me his version of the code and I flashed my microcontroller with that and I was very, very happy with the way that the new code was working. And over the last month or two, Mitch has been sending me regular updates with little tweaks and improvements along the way and I want to show you those today. But first of all, let me show you the back of the clock. Now, the functionality of this clock was improved by adding an extra switch. So this little uh, red push button here allows you to change a number of functions on the clock without having to go back to the PC and connect it. And I've added a little uh, laser etch panel there which gives you the functions and the way this works is that if you press that red function switch between 0 and 9 seconds on the clock you can change the format from 12 hours to 24 hours and back again anytime within that 10 seconds. From 10 to 19 we can blank or unblank the leading zeros. Uh, from 20 to 29 we can change the mode of the colons, we'll look at that in, in a moment, and so on. So there's a total of six functions we can get from one switch. Now to change that on my clock it just meant making a slightly bigger panel down here and I had to cut out a little bit on the, the back of the clock to make that work. So let's turn it back again and just see how that works out when the clock boots up. Okay, I'm just going to reset the clock. We'll just have a look at a couple of the effects that Mitch has added at the, the start at the boot up sequence. And the first thing you'll notice is the version number. Then you see that all the digits change to two different colors. The first change indicates that it's looking for the Wi-Fi second change indicates it's actually connected and then you'll see the time display come up. So let's reboot. Version number, Lixi flip. Lixi flip again and it's connected. So that was the first change that Mitch uh, put into the code. Right, the next thing is we'll look at the, the different modes that he's built in with that red function switch. Okay, well unfortunately I can't show you the first two modes because just at the time of day we're at, it won't matter if we're in 12 or 24 hour mode and we can't blank the leading zero anyway. But what I can show you is the colon mode. Now at the moment you see these colons are actually dimming, I, I call it breathing. Uh, Mitch has built into it a way of turning the colons off. So we can either blink them, have them off altogether, or we can go back into the breathing mode. I think there's a fourth function that just leaves them on permanently. So that's that. Okay, we can go to daylight saving time and back again. We can also change into a different color mode. So that's just plain yellow and that's the Nixie mode. We're now showing the date and at 55 seconds we go back to the normal time display. Now you can also turn that date function off if you want to. I've just left it on and I'm happy with that. So that's some of the functionality that Mitch has built into this. A number of other changes were made to the clock while I had it apart. Now here in Australia, <laughs> particularly where I live, we have a real problem with bugs and insects and so on. And what I was finding was that the light attracts things like moths and spiders and so on at night. And the back of the clock is sealed off, but the front of the clock was completely open. And one of my viewers said, gee, why don't you put a piece of glass in there? And I badly wanted to do that when I built the clock, but I couldn't figure out a way of doing it easily because this bezel just pushes in and there was nothing on the back of it that we could attach a piece of glass to. 
but what I did was I made two clear acrylic spaces. There's one at either end of the aperture where the, the digits show through and they are big enough so that when you press a piece of glass in there they push up against those two acrylic spaces and when the bezel goes in that holds the glass in at the front. There's one little tiny lonely spider sitting on the glass somewhere that was trying to get in. Looks like it's gone now. But yeah, that, that's a big improvement getting that glass in there. Okay, so that's the, the Lixie clock. Remember, you can get the code in the link below if you want it. You know, very heartfelt thanks to Mitch. He put a lot of work and effort into this. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's something that I don't do. And uh, it was good to get someone who's a, a real expert on board for doing that. Okay, let's check out uh, the next thing. One of the other videos I did this year was uh, about a process called steel parkerizing. And parkerizing is a, a hot chemical process for protecting steel and it creates a phosphate coating on the outside of the steel sample. Now, I had a problem in my shop with um, corrosion. Uh, a lot of the tools that I use uh, sitting out on the shelves and so on, and uh, through a combination of poor housekeeping and very humid weather, any bright steel surfaces will corrode very quickly. And I tried all sorts of things, like just regular cleaning and oiling and so on, using different types of coatings, uh, and none of that seemed to work but the parkerizing process I've found to be highly successful. Now this is a, a part that I made some time ago and I parkerized that, it's been sitting out on the shelf and it's still as good as new. But I wanted to be a bit more scientific about the whole process so uh, I did a video, now once again there's a link if you want to go and look at it, but I created these six samples and I treated them in slightly different ways and the idea was to see how they held up over time. Now I think I did this back in uh, August uh, this year, 2019, and these samples have been sitting in my workshop since then, and I've not touched them, they've just been sitting on a shelf. So this is how I recorded uh, what I'd done to each sample, and that's been sitting on the wall there, and just so I could go back to this and, and revisit it and see how it's going. So the first sample I want to focus on here is this number one. Now this was parkerized using the recommended process except that it wasn't dipped in the dry touch oil at the end of that process. And you can see that there is some corrosion starting and this has been stored face down. And I'm guessing that that's where it was sort of in contact with this piece of plywood. So some moisture is lodged there and it's begun that corrosion process. But remember, this was only done with the parkerizing solution, it wasn't uh, followed up with the dry touch oil, which is the recommended procedure. These three samples I'll do all together because they've all got uh, similar results, uh, at least they look the same. Number two is done with the JN Kits dry touch oil, that's the recommended after treatment when you've done the parkerizing. Number three was done with WD-40 and number four was done with a wax. It was a canuba and beeswax mixture. And in fact, that waxy residue is still on that. I can sort of feel it. But the, all three of those have um, held up quite well. There's absolutely no evidence of corrosion anywhere on those. So even though they've been sitting in the same environment, uh, it's, you know, I'm happy with the result there. So it seems that it doesn't matter whether you use WD-40 or a wax or an oil, you know, you get a similar result. Now, this is the control. This was uh, a sample that I cleaned, I polished, I handled it as little as I could, and I put it on a piece of plywood along with the other samples there and just left it. And I'm pretty sure you can see the corrosion is well and truly started on that. And it will only get worse. That's just what happens with corrosion. The corrosion layer traps more moisture and that just accelerates the process. And that's what I was getting with any bright surfaces in my workshop. They would end up looking like that within a few months. Now this is actually five months on from when I started the test. And I want to follow up probably in 12 months to just see how bad that's got. But that's what used to drive me insane in the workshop was leaving tools that I cleaned out on a shelf or in a drawer even. And you would uh, find that in very short time they would start to look like this. Okay, well that's sort of like a five month follow up on that particular test. Uh, you can take the information for what it's worth. I, I think, anyway, that this parkerizing process is a winner for me. 
and I've done a number of tools so far and I'm not disappointed. Okay, here's the final thing. I did a number of videos this year on sandblasting or media blasting. I bought a, a media blasting cabinet and I built my own blast gun. And uh, once again, there's a link up here if you want to go and check that out. Uh, this is what the blast gun looked like, the, the final iteration of what I made. And I did a number of tests on it. It's, it's okay-ish, uh, certainly uh, left room for improvement. And what I said uh, back at that point was that I was going to make a clear blast gun. And a lot of people had commented and said, oh, you should have had a swirl chamber built into it. You know, try changing you know, the internal details of the gun uh, to improve vacuum and mixing and so on. And all of that is good advice, but unless you can actually see inside the gun, it's a bit hard to tell what, what's going on. And I bought a piece of this clear acrylic tube and I 3D printed a handle. And all I need to do is to make some internal structure for this out of some metal. Uh, and then we're going to run the gun and we can actually see how the media is entering the chamber inside the gun and what's happening to it after that. Now I held off from that because I, I did say I wanted to upgrade my compressor. Now I've done that and I've upgraded all of the air delivery in my shop. So let's have a quick look at that. All right, this is what I ended up with. Now this is what they call a silent air compressor. And uh, well, it's not really silent, but it's a, a lot quieter than what I had previously. This one is made by Chicago. It's called a Hush 100. It's actually got three motors and six pumps and uh, it was a bit pricey but gee I tell you what it's a, it's a massive improvement on what I had. The tank we can see there is a hundred litres and uh, I was just going to turn it on to show you what it uh, sounds like but I can't. <laughs> I can. Well, let me turn it on. And nothing actually happens because it's completely full of air. Now I haven't touched this for about a week and uh, I've fixed all of my air delivery to get rid of all the leaks and it's so good that it doesn't sort of leak down over time. So um, in a minute I'm just going to see if I can get it running for you just so you can see that it is much quieter than a regular compressor. Now the other thing I've done is I've upgraded all my air delivery in the shop. I've used now three quarter inch copper pipe these flexible pipes go outside to a receiver and uh, we'll look at that in a minute but all of this pipe now has been leak tested and I'm running half inch pipe down to drops inside the workshop with individual regulators. Now you might say well gee why didn't you run three quarter pipe all the way? Well these regulators really only run things like um, spray guns and uh, dust guns or air guns and that sort of thing so they don't really need a huge volume of air. So I was okay with using half inch copper for those. All right, here's another one that's near my lathe. Once again half inch copper but it goes up to the three quarter inch pipe up there and all of those fittings are silver soldered. Now I've also got a shut off valve here so I can isolate the receiver from the rest of the workshop supply. I'm just going to turn this on. And now the compressor is running. The other interesting thing is that you can turn off two of those motors. So at the moment I've only got one running, this one here. And if you're only just doing some air brushing or something that requires just a small amount of air, it's certainly a big energy saving. But I can turn the other two back on again. It's all three of them running now. Now this was the, the big improvement. This uh, receiver is quite old. Uh, it came from a school where I used to work and it's around about 200 litres. So I now have a total storage of around 300 litres. Those yellow flexible pipes come through from the inside of the, the workshop. And once again, I've leak tested all of this and it's all good. 
Now the important thing is that to run a sandblaster you need to have a high volume of air, not a high pressure, but you need to have good supply, continuous volume. And from this delivery pipe at the top here, it goes inside the shop, it does a right angle turn and it comes out right here. So that fitting there is directly from the three quarter inch pipe and I can connect my sandblasting gun directly to this regulator with a very short pipe. So I'm able to get a high volume of air into the blast cabinet with a very short delivery line. So that's why I didn't sweat too much about having half inch copper for all the other fittings inside the workshop. This one is what I'll be using with my sandblaster. All right, so I'm looking forward to getting on to this little project here. It's gonna be really, really interesting to see what's going on inside there. So I'll catch up with that next year. It's uh, almost the end of 2019 at the moment, and uh, well, it's the end of the decade. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see where we go next year. Lots of interesting times around the world, aren't there? But for now, I'm gonna finish up here. Thanks for watching, thanks to all my viewers. Appreciate the comments. Uh, I like hearing from people all over the world. That's one of the great things about uh, having a YouTube channel is uh, getting in contact with so many different people. So, Preso out for now. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in 2020.